morning everyone. What a beautiful morning it is and welcome to everyone as we gather for a worship service here at Eagleton Parish Church and to those who are tuning in online. It's wonderful that we can gather together as a church family. Just a wee side note to say that I'm not feeling very well today. Um, still leading the service so I didn't want to let you down uh, but I won't be at the door at the end so I'm not being rude and just going off so apologies about that um, so just to let you know it's my sad duty to inform you of the passing of Marie Jeffrey Mary Jeffrey sorry her service of Thanksgiving will be held in the church on Tuesday the 19th of July at 2pm and all are welcome I'm now going to read a, a read it here um, and it's in regards to admission of, to, of an elder um, and it's for John Rennick. John Rennick, member of this congregation, has been elected to be a ruling elder. John Rennick has accepted office as elder. If anyone has any objections why this member should not be admitted to office, they state their objection at a meeting to be planned by the Kirk Station in the Carswell Centre Hub on the 24th of July at 9.30 a.m. If no relevant objection regarding life or doctrine is made and substantiated, the Kirk Session will proceed to the admission. This is by order of the Kirk Session and by the Session Clerk. So if no objections are made, um, the admission of John as an elder to Eagles and Parish Church will go ahead on the 24th of all other intimations are in your order of services. And now our call to worship, taken from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lead not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Let us now stand and sing together our opening hymn, 405. We sing the praise of him who died. <laughs>
please come before God in fear, let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, in mere moments of insight, we try to grasp the beauty and the expansive nature of your love. No words can describe it, no melody contain it, no human being can explain it. Yet we are surrounded by the emblems of your love and peace, in the colours of the sky, in the chaos of the storm, in the song of the birds, in the company of the animals. You tell us all will be well. In our moments of great fear, when alone and anxious, you promise to shelter and protect us. Through days of struggle and heartache, joy and achievement can be surrounded by those that we care about, in companionship of family and friends. You cover us with a blanket of compassion and kindness. The constancy of your grace overwhelms us. The depth of your love leaves us breathless. Standing at the cross, we are transfixed. Gazing, we are troubled, torn and broken. Forgive us, Father, for when we have shut ourselves off from the cascades of grace all around us. For when we have failed to recognise you moving within our lives. Forgive us for taking for granted all that you have done and all that you continue to do for each one of us. At the cross, you don't just try to fix us, you mend us, Lord. Your outstretched arms have enfolded us in a love we've never known. Your grace has healed our troubled souls. Your love is the most incredible of all. Let your love now live through us, we pray as we glorify your name in all that we say and in all that we do. Walking in the footsteps of your Son and our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who taught us to say these words together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now it's best to to come up and talk to you. Good morning. Um, the astute of you will have noticed I wasn't here uh, last week uh, that because I've just spent a week at a scripture union camp uh, called LM1, that's Lendrick Muir 1, and that's for the first week of the summer holidays I was at Lendrick Muir with uh, 60 young people um, and a whole team of volunteers and we had an amazing time out in the sun so if you see me a little bit burnt that's why um, and if you hear me a little bit croaky it's not COVID I've tested don't worry it's just because traffic young people um, <laughs> but uh, I wanted to talk to you guys a wee bit about um, righteousness and living for and with God so can anyone tell me what righteousness means No? It's one of those weird words we use all the time as Christians. We go around saying, oh, we're righteous, we're this, we're that. But we don't actually think about what it means. But righteousness at its core is meaning living right with God. And that's what our theme is today. And when I think of living right with God, my mind always goes to the passage where the disciples go out from Jesus to the community. They go out and they start serving because Jesus tells them to. Now my question to you is, does anyone know what this may be? A charger, this is a power brick, a portable charger. I have two cables in it, I could have a third. Um, but this is a charger. I put my phone in this, it helps keep me charged up when I'm out and about 
on the go. But this charger is pretty useless if I don't have these cables. This cable is the one that I use for connecting my phone to this. And this is almost like the disciples taking what they've learned from Jesus, taking the grace and the righteousness that they have and sharing it with the community. They're plugging themselves in. They're going right in amongst them and charging them up. But they can't do that without this cable. This is the cable that connects them to the source, connects them to the wall, connects them to the plug, connects them to Jesus. If you don't have this cable, you die. This charger is fully charged, thankfully. Um, if it wasn't, then uh, there would be a problem. I wouldn't be able to keep my phone charged up. And similarly, we can quite often think we're going to plug ourselves into the community. We can plug ourselves right in. But when we do so, we take ourselves away from the source. Now, this portable charger is somewhat problematic. It's not constantly connected to the source. I can't walk around with a plug connected to a socket in this infinitely long cord. I could connect it to another portable charger, but then that portable charger just has the same problem. But the thing about Jesus is we know the Holy Spirit is with us. The Holy Spirit is like that port plug in the wall, this infinitely long cable that's constantly with us, constantly charging us up, constantly boosting us to charge our communities. So my encouragement to us is when we think of moving with righteousness, moving right with God, that we think about how not only are we charging each other, the people around us, our front line of life, but how are we making sure we're not getting disconnected from God and losing all our charge? Now, one of the ways that we are wanting to live right with God, one of the ways we're wanting to live right with God this summer is through the holiday club. We're wanting to see young people coming to the church. We've not had a holiday club since 2019, and we now have over 20 young people signed up, ready to come along, and we're excited for this. But one of the things that I want to see is I want to see us coming together as a church community and coming in a week off at a camp and seeing that board there with post-it notes on it of things that we need for this club, already having things taken away from it, having people suddenly come up to me saying, where's the box? I've got the things here already as I'm setting up the box. That brought so much joy to my heart. So if you can and are able to, please take a post-it note from there. Please look at it, see what you can help us with. And if you are able to help us on the 1st to the 5th in person, in person, if you are able to be there in person and support us, that would be so incredible. And if you want to be involved in some way, it doesn't need to be face-to-face -face with young people. There are tons of things that we could do um, and we need help with. Um, please come and let me know so that I can get you plugged in and helping our young people. So I think we're now going to sing our next song, which is Jesus Loves Me, This I Know.
reading is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, verses 1 to 11, entitled, No Confidence in the Flesh. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Amen. May God bless this reading from his word. We now continue to praise God singing hymn number 506. All I once held dear built my life upon. <laughs>
which will last three weeks. And then on the last Sunday of July, Myrtle will lead a summer club service, which will be my last service as I go off on holiday before going, uh, then going off on maternity leave uh, for a year. This series we begin today is a continuation of the book of Philippians, looking at the next two chapters, chapters 3 and 4. And although myself, I'm a big fan of following the lectionary, which is where there are chosen passages that churches throughout the world follow together, I do think it's good from time to time to journey with a particular book of the Bible and it's why we've had just one scripture reading these last few weeks, helping us focus in on detail on the book from Paul to the Philippines. The sermon series we finished last week was called Practice What You Preach. And today we begin Eyes on the Prize with today's sermon entitled Right Standing with God. Have you ever heard the saying, youth is wasted on the young? That was something that the late Jack McCosh used to quote, member of this church, for no less than 62 years. And in many ways, that saying is true. Those that have the world at their feet, full of health and energy and full of potential, can often take it for granted and squander it. If only at an old age, with all that we have learned through the years, all that wisdom, what we could do with all the opportunities that being young brings. But looking back on our lives as Christians can be a blessing. It shows how far we've come and it can inspire others to come to Christ too. Knowing that we didn't always have it figured out, we weren't always the person we are today, can really be humbling and inspiring to those who feel they're in that same position too. Sending a strong message to them that it's never too late and you've never gone too far to come to Christ. Paul, in our last two chapters of Philippians, has been talking about how to put our faith into action. And in chapter 2, verse 16, he says that we must practice what we preach in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labour for nothing. And that kind of boasting is the only worthy kind in Paul's eyes because it's about giving glory to God. It's never of our own doing, even if he works through us because it is not I but Christ in me. That is why last week Paul highlighted two role models in Philippians, people that they knew, Timothy and Ephraim, who had served Christ with their actions and brought glory to God. That is why Paul is able to boast about them, because they are living testimony to God and equipping them to do his will. Today is about right standing with God and Paul makes it clear in this passage today that it has absolutely nothing to do with us and all to do with Christ. Paul, who had been a Pharisee, looks back on his own life as an example of how following the law does not make you righteous, warning the Philippians not to make the same mistake as he did. Circumcision was a mark of the covenantal relationship between man and God. A promise that he would be with them and that they would be equipped to do God's will of blessing all nations. Circumcision was a sign of the flesh that they were set apart in this covenantal relationship with God. This was a promise given to Abraham in the very first book of the Bible and can be found in chapter 12, verses 1 to 3 of Genesis. It says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you, I will make your name great 
and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And in chapter 17, verses 11 to 14, circumcision is a sign of the covenant. God says to Abraham, you are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner those who are not your offspring. Whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. This was a command from God so that Abraham's descendants could be blessed. It was a circumcision of the flesh, when still done by one's free will, to enter into this covenant relationship by the sacrifice of flesh and blood that would set the males apart from the world to do God's purposes. This is a covenant of the Old Testament. But Jesus would become the sacrificial lamb, the atonement for all the sins of mankind, a pure and spotless sacrifice to God. Through his death on the cross, God's plan could be fulfilled in blessing all nations once and for all, as Jesus cried out on the cross in John 19.30, it is finished. Now, all of us can enter into a covenantal relationship with God through repentance and belief in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Jesus can wipe every stain away, every sin, and equip us every step of the way into eternal life with him. Both the Old and the New Covenant show us that from beginning of time, God has been faithful, keeping his promise to bless us all. But man alone couldn't achieve this. It could only be done on the cross by our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So God now asks for a circumcision of our hearts. When we take communion, we break bread and drink wine to remember the body broken and the blood shed for us. We read in Matthew 26, verses 26 to 28, of Jesus speaking at that Last Supper. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Paul brings to the fore in our text today that whilst one can follow the law, it is the heart, the circumcision of the heart, that God looks for. If his heart is sinful, then the physical act of circumcision has no purpose at all. The law just isn't enough. A person must have a change in their heart, the circumcision of the heart through Jesus Christ. For circumcision does not make one have a right standing with God, faith does. As a Pharisee, Paul had believed that he was righteous before God because he had followed the law. He was circumcised on the eighth day, and yet he lived a life being anything but righteous as he persecuted the church. Looking back, Paul can see that he had no right standing with God. His ways were not God's ways that we know of 
to his son, Jesus Christ. It is now in Christ that Paul has this perspective on life that he shares with the Philippians. Nothing else has value than following the way of Christ, Paul says, in verses 8 to 9 of our text today. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. And so, so today's text is a warning to the Philippians that right standing with God cannot come from the flesh, but comes from the heart. Paul has written to the church in Rome, stating all about the circumcision of the heart in Romans chapter 2, verse 29. Circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise it not from me, but from God. Paul continues to challenge us as we think that we are only to boast in Christ Jesus. And he has challenged us these last three weeks as we've been reminded that Jesus calls his followers to be humble, to serve another above ourselves, to trust in his ways over our own, but our deeds to match our belief. And I will say that it's amazing what you can still listen to whilst looking after a two-year-old in the children's corner, as my husband has been on my tail pointing out when I've been grumbling or complaining when Paul has told us not to in a previous sermon series. I'm living proof that no one is perfect. The theme, though, that continues in the book of Philippians is that, we, is that we are set apart for God's purposes. That we should be known as Christians by our words and by our actions. By what we give our attention to, by what we don't. And what we consider our focus, as Paul states in chapter 2, verse 21 of Philippians. But everyone looks out for their own interests rules Jesus Christ. So today Paul warns us about not being legalistic about our faith, that it's not about following rules but following the ways of Jesus who makes it possible by faith in him alone. As Paul says in Romans chapter 2 verse 13, for it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. It's about honouring God in the way you live your life. How many years you've been coming to this church, how many good deeds you've done throughout your life won't get you the right standing with God. But as we read in Proverbs 21 verse 2, all of man's ways seem right to him the Lord weighs the heart. We come here today to give praise back to the God who we boast about because his ways are the best. Everything else we will leave behind as we commit to follow him. Not glorifying our own deeds, but praising the one who makes all things possible. We come to learn how to love him better in our lives so that we can follow and serve him in everything that we do. Today, we need to fix our eyes on Christ. We as Christians are called to continue the work of Christ, of blessing all nations. And this can only be done if we have wholehearted faith in Christ, if we commit to following him in everything that we do. Don't be tempted to thinking we can earn God's grace is given freely to each of us when we trust in his Son. 
their eyes should be on the prize of eternity with God. But that doesn't mean that there isn't blessing to be found here and now. We only have to look around us to witness how God works and moves in our lives. Youth is often wasted on the young, but we only need to look at Paul to see that the Bible is full of people who change their lives because they've changed their hearts. It's never too late. You've never gone too far. New life can be found, not earned, through the Son of God. And so it's no wonder why Paul thinks we should all be doing a lot less grumbling and a lot more rejoicing. Let us now stand and sing together how deep the Father's love for us, him 549, whilst our offering is not lost. <laughs> The psalmist said, 
Come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. Lord, we come with thankfulness for all the people who serve us in our daily lives. Thank you for the many people who support us in different ways, for those in leadership positions and those who minister your word to us, for those who care for us by serving in shops or working to supply the things we often take for granted. We also thank you for the special help we receive in times of crisis. Lord, we bless you for those who serve faithfully and for all who follow you, our servant King. Thank you that Jesus has given us the ultimate example of servanthood, that he lived and died and rose again for us. We bring before God all who serve as carers, that they would receive strength and patience as they enhance the lives of others day by day and that parents would be nurtured even as they nurture their children. Lord, bless all who support young people in summer activities, remembering those involved in our holiday club and BB camp. Would you protect each one and encourage both leaders and young people as they grow in faith in Jesus. We ask God's blessing and protection on all who go out to help others in war zones or in areas of extreme need, risking their own lives to help others. May they be strengthened and encouraged in their service. And at this time especially, we pray for politicians in our country, praying that God would raise up people of true integrity looking to him for wisdom to serve their people. We also pray for leaders in our churches and for the Spirit's vision as they plan for the future and manage the challenges of change. For all who serve, Lord, would you give them times of refreshment in these summer months that they would be re-energised to serve again, whether in the public eye or at home. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Shelley. Now let us stand, if you are able, as we sing our final hymn, 424, Blessed Be the Everlasting.
and the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all. Thank you. 